Hi everyone, and welcome to Bridging the Gap. I'm your host, Kelly Lavelle, and this week we're joined by our expert guest, Barbara Moet, to talk to you about growing your business. Barbara is an international leader in the development of SME enterprises, with a special emphasis on women. She is CEO of Impact Communications, a multifaceted consulting company, as well as founder of Grow Your Biz, an initiative that brings a tactical approach to meeting the needs of business owners of women of all ages. Barbara, I'm so excited to have you with us today. Could you start us off by sharing a little bit about your journey and how you got started in the business world? Thank you, Kelly. Yeah, you know, I do want to go back to the beginning because my company is over 30 years old. But, um, you know, I want to share that for the first 15 years of my life and career, I was in education. Uh, I, I was a teacher of uh, all, in fact, I, I taught all levels, uh, including elementary, junior high, high school, community college, and graduate studies at UBC in summer sessions. For me, I had been teaching for 15 years. And what I realized is that that was great when I was raising my three children, but now I realized I was a closet entrepreneur. And it, it came at a time in the early 80s where uh, I realized that I was I no longer wanted to be in, in teaching, even though, um, you know, my dean and my uh, and the president probably had me looking at uh, a VP or a, a different kind of role, I decided that I was going to quit. Now, I quit at a very awkward time. It was in the 80s when everything was going down. We had, in, and I'm in BC, so there was the forest industry, the mining industry, the, uh, the, the uh, fishing industry, interest rates were sky high. And all of a sudden it was scary because it was a bit like what's happening in our, uh, in our province, uh, what was happening across Canada, what was happening in the US. And long gone were the um, idea that a big company was gonna come and give 200 jobs to a community whether it was the auto industry or the mining industry. So I realized that I was really, you know, here I had given up a big salary and uh, a really great package, but I wanted to really study this. And it was all about community economic development. And even though everyone complained about it was the bank's fault because they were high interest and they didn't give loans to small businesses, when I dug deeper, I realized that it was actually access to markets was the number one issue. And think about Canada. Think about our rural areas. Think about little tiny communities, whether, you know, Prespa 2 BC, population 381, uh, Flin Flon, Mount I mean, you can go right across the country. And we are very much rural based in so many areas of Canada. And so we had to take a look at a different model. How would we help these people market their products? That was the beginning of my journey into entrepreneurship. And I think you bring up a, um, several really key points that I would like to just revisit a little bit further. Um, the first being access to capital. You had mentioned kind of how that, that was one of the key struggles you had identified with businesses, particularly in rural areas in Canada. And I think that problem is also very um, prominent for young entrepreneurs or business owners in general, regardless kind of in their area, um, access to those markets is, is difficult sometimes because you don't necessarily have that existing relationship um, and reputation like like you have had now when you started grow your biz for example that we that young entrepreneurs can lean on so to speak to navigate into the market do you have any advice for those young business owners on how they should approach getting into the market you know I have to go back remember what I said that's what everybody thought was the number one issue was access to capital and i'm saying to you that's not the number one issue the number one issue is access to markets so if you've got a product or a service i don't care what field you're in you better make sure it's what people want so let's start with products and services first because you know what maybe you shouldn't be growing your business maybe you've got the wrong business model so if you go into a financial institution to try to get capital for your idea, what proof do you have that it's going to work? So please, please, my advice to all young people 
is to make sure that whatever you're starting, I want to encourage you. I definitely encourage entrepreneurship and I don't care what the idea is, but let's make sure that there's a market for it because once you show that you've got a, a, a product or a service that's marketable and people want to buy, then the next step is access to capital. And for that, you need a proper, uh, you need to have a proper strategic plan. Where do you want to go with this business? Who's going to be your target market? You know, you hear people saying, oh, just do a business plan. Well, a business plan and business is living. It's a living document. So you can't just say to, the, to a financial institution, yes, here's my plan. We'll take a look at it. They want to know who's behind it. So you have to make sure that you've got them. You know, people always like to blame others for their demise. But in most cases, it's the management and it's the you, the entrepreneur. So you have to make sure that that's where the advisory boards come in. That's where the peer support comes in. That's where the trusted advisors come in. You need to test it first. You need to make sure that, you know, if you want to stay locally, that's fine. But who's your market? Who's your competitors? Who's your different? What are you going to differentiate? You know, it's really, it's really about, yes, I always use a phrase, uh, sell your strengths and buy your weaknesses. And in most cases, there's three areas that a business person needs to have a startup, whatever stage that's the technical skills. And what I mean by that is that you, you have a good product or a good service and you know what it's all about. Second is that you need to have good sales and marketing. Who's going to buy it? Who's going to sell it for you? Because that's really key. And then the third one is to have is to be financially savvy. Most entrepreneurs are not, and I call it the trinity of business. Most entrepreneurs are not good in all three areas. So before you approach a bank, before you approach a financial institution, you better have those three solid. You better be able to say, this is what my product and service can do. This is what it is. This is how exciting it is. This is why there's a need for it. And you've proven it by being able to sell it to some people, to some organizations. And then you've got the solid financial management to show what the growth potential is. Does that make sense? sense? Yes, but with that in mind, like when I think that's the point, I, uh, the part I want to focus on is um, often we have the idea, we have maybe friends and family who like our product or are, are, have supported us, but how do young entrepreneurs take it that next step? How do they grow it in the market? Um, before so they're ready to go for that next step in the financial institutions because that that's that's a big leap okay because first of all get away from friends and family friends and family love you they care about you they're not they're, they they you know when you go into an international country and you see all these people these uh beautiful uh uh artisans and they're in stalls and you and you do a sentimental buy you do a sentimental buy no different than craft fairs no different than what you see happening here and they buy your product or your service, but it really isn't a true test. You can start there, but you need to take it to that next level to prove that it has a life outside your friends and family. And I really say that sincerely because, you know, that's that's key. So you bring those you bring those products home from other countries and they sit on a shelf and you go, oh, what did I buy that for? Like you don't you don't really need it, but you buy it because you care about that person. So build your sale, make sure there's a need or a want for your products or services. And there's all kinds. I mean, you know, in Kitchener Waterloo, they have Communitech here. And I mean, there's, if you're in technology, there's a lot of places where you can test pro your products. So once that's done, then, you know, there are, and I know that, I know that access to markets is an important part. And sometimes it is just that 10,000, 15,000, $100,000 to get you going. And there are organizations out there. I know that, uh, and, I'll, and I'll put a plug for uh, Vicki Saunders Shio. There are organizations out there uh, that are really looking at helping um, small businesses grow with a focus on women entrepreneurs. And um, so, you know, first of all, it's difficult for uh, everyone to know what's out there. There's futurepreneur. There is um, uh, the a, a number of organizations that actually help youth go to the next level, but they have to go through a process 
of making sure that they've tested their idea, their product, their service, and they actually do have potential sales. So I used to say, when you have potential sales, that's when you want to go with your financial person to an FI, to a to one of those. Uh, you know, I think right now FWE is doing something for pitch your purse. Uh, Telus always does the one hundred per the one hundred thousand uh, dollar again pitch your pitch your uh, pitch your uh, business. So there are a lot. There is actually a lot out there. Is there enough? No. And then the next gap is not only the startup. The next gap is when you have growing your business. I would say to about seven eight employees maybe a uh, 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 a million dollar or two million dollar then you need that access to capital to take it to the next stage so there's like brick walls all the way through your um your progress and at every stage you are probably looking for capital to really try to take your business to the next level and you won't know what that is until it hits you with that in mind, um, what is your opinion on the role of uh, personal brand and its influence in, in bringing your business from startup to scale, et cetera? Um, I find that that is some, uh, a topic that's of, of a lot of interest right now um, with young entrepreneurs because sometimes we don't have necessarily the reputation of or the experience in the industry to, to lean on. So sometimes uh, a strategy is to build up that personal brand, but then you did make the comment too about that sentimental buy. So if you have somewhat of a personal brand, depending what that is, you could almost get that conflicted with the sentimental buy so you don't necessarily know if the product stands on its own. Yeah, I agree. I, I mean, I think... Um... Well, Kelly, I think you've got a personal brand. I think that you have really um, branded yourself as a as a young entrepreneur who understands uh, the millennial group. And I think that, you know, uh, when you read your bio, you go, wow, this is a young talent. Let's watch her. Right. So it is true that that if you can get a personal brand, um, it really does help. But I still think it goes back to it's not just about the brand, personal brand. It's about what do you stand for? What's your credibility? And that takes some, you know, that's what I watch for. So it's all about not just the brand and the name. It's about what's your core values? What's your, what's your vision? And for me, most importantly, is what's your core value? And if you ever read, and I'm sure you have read Jim Collins' book, you know, Good to Great, and you know you will he will name people uh and you think oh i know that name but then when you do you know who the do you know who the founder of 3m is guaranteed 90% of the people don't because it's about the quality of the product and the service it's not just about the name i like that you point on that cuz i think you're right sometimes the strongest brands are in some sense the um, ones with silent leaders in the sense that you let your actions speak for themselves. And when you have that strong purpose and that why that in itself will attract sometimes your markets and, and your, and your, your first early adopters or sales and things like that, because they want to believe in that purpose uh, or that, or that why that's attached to your product or service. That's exactly right. I mean, that's why Simon Sinek's book is so good is start with the why, why am I doing this? And so when I start at Grow Your Biz, I want to make, so when I go out and I do a presentation to potential members or to organizations to say, well, you know, why Grow Your Biz? Why not, why not all the other ones that are out there like Mastermind and, and YPO and EO? And I go, yeah, there's everything out there. Like, I'm not competing with that, but I want to tell my story. I want to tell why in the last 30 years, I've been very, um, I've been very consistent with my core values of helping women entrepreneurs. Uh, that's my belief. That's my passion. And this is just another way of doing that. So for me, it's always been there. It's not like, uh, you know, and I will be honest with people. I'll say, you know what, um, grow your business, not for you. Or, you know, why don't you try this? Because if you're just interested in sales or marketing, there are so many networking groups out there that you can do that. And so I'm very honest with people. It's like, you have to be, you have to follow your dream. You have to follow your passion, but more importantly, you have to follow your core values and your vision. 
And then you, I want to touch on one other point that you brought up that I think is also very critical. Uh, you emphasize the importance of an advisory board, and I think particularly uh, for young entrepreneurs, that that mentorship piece is so critical yes. when you're starting out. And I've experienced that very much. I would not be where I am today if I hadn't had mentors who have helped kind of show me the way, or even just help me point out the pitfalls that I should avoid. For someone who's starting off who doesn't necessarily have that immediate mentorship network in place, how can they go about finding those advisors or mentors? You know what I always, what I will say to someone is write down, think about that. Think about what do you want? What's, what's your struggle right now? What's your biggest challenge? And you write that down and then you think about all the people that you know in your, in your community, across the country. I mean, you have to reach for the stars and write down that name. And you know what? Give that person a call and just be honest. Always be authentic. Talk from the heart and just say, you know, I'm calling you because I've read about you. I've watched your career. I'm fascinated by you. Would you consider giving me would you consider giving me maybe 30 minutes of your time to begin with? I would really love to get your i'm a young and just tell the truth i'm a young entrepreneur here's the area i'm struggling with and i would really like to have a mentor like yourself who uh and it, you know you don't have to ask for a lot of time it might be once a quarter will you give me one hour or once a quarter will you give me a half hour it is amazing how many people that have made it want to pay forward and are you know they often don't say no if you're authentic and you're genuine and you're not asking them for uh, a contract or you're not, at, you know, you're really, you're really sincere and you're saying, you know, um, I want to, uh, so think of somebody in, in the branding because you're really trying to brand yourself. So who has done a great job of branding themselves that's youth oriented and that maybe you can call up? That's how I would start. I started that way. In my very first, I went to one of Jimmy Pattison's um, when I was dealing with the publication, uh, Home Business Report. I was nowhere. So I went to one of his, uh, he, he was a friend in my community, and his name was John, and he ran the Great Pacific News for Jimmy Pattison. And I said, John, I'm starting this magazine. It was a newsletter. And I said, would you give me a half hour of your time? He gave me, uh, he gave me a half hour of his time. But he said, to be a successful magazine, you need three things. You need, and I was just a newsletter. He said, you need subscribers. Yeah, I had subscribers. You need uh, to be on the shelves of magazine shelves. I didn't have that. And because I didn't have that, and you need advertisers. That's what you need for a successful magazine. Advertisement, subscribers, and, and, and on the shelves. Simple. It was like, oh my God, of course that's right. I mean, it was just something very clear. And I went, you are right. But I only had subscribers. I didn't have the other two yet. So th those tips can be just like, like, wow, never thought of that. And those golden nuggets come out when you talk to somebody who has got more experience than you and has uh, definitely uh, been there. And that's why the one I use is, you know, sell your strengths and buy your weaknesses every one of you, you have strength, but you also have weaknesses. What are they? That's where you need to ask the mentor for help. I like that. And also with that in mind, um, having a very clear um, kind of direct ask when you reach out to a mentor of what it is you're seeking yes. from them or like what piece of advice I have found in my journey. Um, if you're too kind of broad and kind of loose in your ask, um, the mentor doesn't see the value sometimes in giving the time because they don't really know what you're seeking from them. So Correct. definitely um, know what you, how they can help you or what that question is. Correct. Um, with that in mind, when you were kind of using your example and you, were, and you had mentioned how you didn't have um, some of the things he had recommended, when a youth is, or when a business owner just in general, what, in your opinion, what do you think is the number one thing that they should invest in when they're trying to grow their business? Invested in terms of, well, they have to be, they have to be very, they have to invest in, first of all, putting together a very strategic plan. That's gonna be a living plan. So start with your core values and why you are starting, start with the why do you want to start this business? So you have to start with investing in your own, in your own awareness 
of why you are doing what you're doing and where do you want it to go. And you should also be building from the very beginning, build your business with an exit strategy in mind. And I say that because I did not do that with my first businesses, which is why I let them go, really, to be honest with you. And so now it's about, you know, when someone, because you're not going to always run your business. And if you are a one person shop, how much can you take on? How much can you do, right? You've only got so much time in a day. So you need to be thinking about that back to that strategic plan. What's your goal? What's your vision? If you're just creating something to keep money in your pocket on a month to month basis, that's different. But if you're saying, I really want to grow this business, you need to take a look at how can you do that? What's your business model? So that's where you go back to, you know, here's how I want it to look. So invest in, first of all, knowing where you want to go. If you don't know where you're going, you'll end up somewhere else, right? That's a quote from a book called, I don't even know what I remember it was called, it was in the seventies. Uh, but it's one of those things. If you don't know where you're going, you'll end up somewhere else. So be very clear about that. Then you have to invest in things like, uh, I will say controlled growth, because it's not just about sales and marketing. It's about who's then going to do it all, the personnel part of it. And then it's about, can I afford to do this? What, what's my financial stake? And then do I have the capacity to do it, my operations? So it's about, you know, it's about people think, oh, I just need to, I just need to get out there and sell more. Well, selling more doesn't give you more profit. So you have to look at sales and marketing, the operations, the financial side and the personnel side, who's going to do all this. If you've got three contracts tomorrow, all in a row, they all wanted a deadline of the end of the week. How are you going to do that? How do you make that decision? So you have to invest in putting together a business model that's going to work for you as to where do you want to go? And then it might be, um, obviously I always believe in investing in human resources first, um, because, often you can't do it all. So you need to learn how to delegate. So does that mean that you need, the first thing that you might need is an assistant. What is it that you're doing that you could easily give up? That's where everything from when you're, you know, when you're a small startup, you might start with a virtual assistant, somebody just booking your appointments, somebody that's following up and collecting your bills for you, somebody, you know, so invest in human resources. That's for me, the number one, everybody is different. Everyone's different, but, uh, chances are, as you're growing, you will not be able to do everything yourself. And you probably want to do everything yourself because you know you can do it better than anyone else. And you're afraid that it's going to take up too much time to train somebody else. And all of that's true. All of that's true. But you have to take a look at the future. Where do you want it back to? Where do you want to go? So human resources, and then obviously putting together systems, things that are going to help you be more organized so that you could be more efficient. And sometimes that goes hand in hand with financial assistance, right? I need to, you know, I need to get, you know, I need to buy this software. Well, it's all clown now. Um, so it's, that's sort of my order. I think you bring up really two really good points in that is um, the focusing on the operations and the processes, I think are two things that and even in my experiences, I overlooked. I think sometimes we get when we're starting a business or we're very passionate about an idea or we want to be successful, you kind of have the the vision of the of the success, so to speak. So you're focused on the sales or the the growth and the and kind of the the front end, I would say, areas, but you forget that all of that front end has to be run by the behind the scenes <laughs> operations and processes. When you see a, a celebrity on the red carpet, it's not just the celebrity that's there. There was hair, there was makeup, there was the fashion and wardrobe. There was all these other behind the scenes that put that red carpet look together. But we often don't see that. We just look at the glam, so to speak. So right. I think that's a really important point because those are really the the critical points of growing is that capacity is usually the I think one of the first things that stops a business sometimes from growing is the fact that they 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 lose contracts or they run out of capacity to fulfill what they their their operation or their demand. 
Absolutely. And if you, you know, um, I'll just uh, put a plug in. So we have uh, Grow Your Biz has an e-guide book that's about growing your business, strategic growth, right? And the co-author is Ted James. And uh, but another section that was uh, given provided by Bill um, Erickson, and he calls the model the growth trap and the growth trap. Definitely, because most of us who are running a business, the first thing we think about is, oh, I've got to, I've got to get somebody to do business selling business development. And so you go out there and you hire somebody or you go out there and you come back and you've made and I'll just give this as an example, you make um, sales of twelve hundred dollars. But then you take a look at the operations and they're only operating at, I'm just throwing these numbers out as, as an example, okay? And they're operating at at only nine hundred dollars. Uh, that's their op that's their budget. So their capacity isn't at the twelve hundred. So all of a sudden what happens? You probably have to work overtime. That's when you're putting in longer hours. You're ignoring uh, maintenance schedules and you're probably uh, very slow in uh, paying your bills. So then that's because it ties into the financial side. The financial side is only uh, only has 600, only able to do $600. And so there's a sales at 1200. So now what are they doing? Well, they're probably paying their bills later. They're, uh, they're running into a cash flow problem and uh, they're, you know, having to deal with a bank. But then the worst part of it is the personnel. So, you know, you thought that you were going to have more time. Oh, if I only had more sales, but in fact, you're probably now working overtime. If people are working with you, their morale is down or they're thinking about quitting and, you know, because it's too long hours. So that's called the growth trap. And that's why you have to do what we call controlled growth. And controlled growth really does mean that you have to look at everything together. You cannot just go out there and make sales. You have to actually know that you are able to uh, deal with operations, financial and personnel. And that's why you sit down and you say, okay, human resources are very important, but so is my operations. So do I have the capacity, right? And, and when I was, I remember when we were doing the trade shows and in some cases, a person would get excited when all of a sudden Walt Disney buyer came to them and said, oh, we love your product. And all of a sudden they went, Walt Disney or Walmart, that's great. But they would then invest in production and it maybe only last two years. And then, you know, Walmart would go to someplace else. Walt Disney would go to someplace else. They want a different product. And all of a sudden you're left with you've hired more people. You've you've. Uh, brought in different operations, you've bought in more equipment or whatever it might be of manufacturing. And now all of a sudden you're in trouble. So it's all about controlled growth. Don't always say yes to something if you haven't sat down and looked at what you are capable of doing. And do you have the financial resources and the human resources to actually execute it? I think that that's so critical and you're right. Um, sometimes we can over promise and they always say under promise over deliver <laughs> is, yeah. the, is the go to saying, I believe. Uh, oh, yeah. It's always better to kind of exceed expectations than to ch um, bite off more than you can chew. And believe me, you know, I have to say this, Kelly, and I'll be the first one to admit it is that you're constantly learning. So I've been in business 30 years. Big deal. I'm still learning. I'm still learning. And so I want to mention that, too is that we can never take things for granted and you have to always i mean for me i'm 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 totally ti what that refers to is technically adept and so i have to have these wonderful bright people around me that deals with the technology and all this cloud stuff i mean i'm old-fashioned and i would be the first one to admit it so it's like oh you know it takes me forever to learn it took me forever to learn how to use twitter or, or LinkedIn or, or Instagram. I mean, I'm just, it's just all foreign to me. So we can never think that we have learned everything. It's always about who do I now need as a mentor? So I have my own, you know, I have to have, I'm not afraid to ask. And that's the other important thing. Do not be afraid to ask. Thank you again, Barbara, for joining me on Bridging the Gap. I really appreciate you taking the time to share your insight with our listeners. And for our listeners now, it's your turn. What do you think? Give this podcast a thumbs up if you like some of the advice Barbara has shared. And now add your thoughts to the discussion using the hashtag Bridging the Gap on Twitter. Thanks again for listening. And remember, together we can start bridging the gap between industry and youth.